Solomon said that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, it is the glory of kings to search it out. In the book of Revelation, it talks about priest and kings, referring back to Exodus 19. We are offered, if we would keep his commandments, to be priests and kings. And so it is the glory of these priests and kings to search it out. We have with us Nehemiah Gordon back with us, and we are searching out some of the greatest treasures that have been hidden. Some of these things hidden by God to preserve it for this day and time, and these are the things being revealed. Uh, good to have you back with us this Great week. Great to be back, Michael. You know, some things are sometimes hidden in plain sight. So, so we, we were talking last time about this uh, coin that was produced by King, uh, King of Denmark. Ironically, his name was Christian IV. And <laughs> Christian IV of Denmark uh, produced these coins that had Yehovah with the full vowels in Hebrew, uh, produced in the 1640s. And uh, on the coin, he also has the phrase Justus Judex, which is a Latin phrase, which in, translates from the Hebrew Shofet Tzedek. And that comes from a verse in the Bible that he, or number of verses, but one of them, for example, is Jeremiah 11.20. It says, Vayehovah Tzvaot Shofet Tzedek. Yehovah of hosts is the righteous judge. Oh. And so you know, why did this king put Yehovah's name on a coin? And, and, and this has to do with the context that was going on at that time in Europe. This was the time of, the, um, of these great wars that were happening in Europe, these wars between the Protestants and the Catholics. And the Protestants in particular wanted to say God's on our side. And of course the Catholics said the same thing. And when the Catholics would express that, one of the ways they would do that was through art. And they would say, oh, God's on our side. Let's make a uh, ceiling with God as an old man with a white beard, you know, who's touching Adam, right? You know, was, in other words, the, they use art and they were representing Yehovah through, um, as a man, right? Because that was their artistic tradition. And the mm -hmm. Protestants, uh, Protestants said, well, wait a minute, that's forbidden. And why is it forbidden? Because it says in Deuteronomy, you didn't see a man in the day of the, of the, of the congregation, meaning the day of the revelation of Sinai, and the Protestants said, Protestants said that we're going to take that literally and not make an image of the Father. And so instead they represented Yehovah by his name. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is recently a friend went and visited the, Bible, the, the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. And they have there on display a page from the original 1611 King James Version. And I actually want to say it's from the 1613 reprint but uh, I don't remember the exact details, but it's from one of the early versions of the King James, and it, and it has this image of, of the biblical world, essentially, and at the top is, in the cloud, Yehovah with the full vowels. So you're seeing this in books, you're seeing it on coins, you're seeing it in all kinds of different places, in churches in a lot of places. We, we talked about mm -hmm. that in the Karite Files. All over you're seeing Yehovah's name in Europe at this time, and part of the reason is because of the struggle between the Catholic, Catholics and the Protestants. So we mentioned this coin uh, made by Christian IV of Denmark. And one of the things I wanted for years is to actually have one of these coins. When I was younger, Michael, I was kind of a coin nerd. I collected mm. coins. Um, well, this was well beyond my, my means to have a coin like this. But what I decided to do is contact a mint in Utah and have them make a replica of the coin with the front based on the coins from the 1640s of the King of Denmark, where it says Yehovah, uh, and in the back, the verse from Malachi, my name is great among the nations. Let me read that verse in its context, Michael, because the verse there in Malachi starts in verse five. I mean, it starts before that, right? But verse five is, is a key mm -hmm. verse in this context. It says, and your eyes will see, and here he's speaking to the Jews, and you will say, Yigdal Yehovah me'al gvul Yisrael. Yehovah has been magnified beyond the borders of Israel. Meaning at that time, they were in this little province of Judah and they had a very provincial attitude. And they said, well, you know, God is our, Yehovah is our God and the Egyptians have their God and the Moabites have their God and the Phoenicians have their God. And Malachi is coming to them and saying, no, this isn't just your God. He's the God who appeared to your ancestors at Mount Sinai, but he didn't appear to your ancestors just for you. And like you said, the right. kingdom of nation of priests, the Mechet Kohanim Vagoy Kadosh, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The purpose of Israel from the very beginning, as Jews understand it, was to be that light to the nations. 
uh, to spread the glory of Yehovah's name. That was our mandate. It wasn't for us. It was to bring this message to the world, which we didn't always do such a good job of doing. Um, in verse 11, he then has the, uh, the verse, which we quoted before in the last episode, for the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, my name is great among the nations, for my name is great among the nations, says Yehovah of hosts. And there's a little passage in the middle there, Michael, where he says, um, in every place, Incense is burned to my name and, and a pure offering. And, and that's really interesting because because my, my, my Jewish um, uh, um, legalism, and I'm going to call it that, looks at this verse and says, what's Malachi talking about? The only place in the world you're allowed to bring incense is at the temple in Jerusalem. And how do I know that? Because it says it in Exodus, right? right? Or at the time it was the tabernacle, later it became the temple. It says it in Exodus. We understand it from Leviticus, from Deuteronomy. You can only bring offerings at the place where Yehovah put his name forever. Mm -hmm. And that's not a, a church in Iceland. That is not um, some place where they're honoring Yehovah's name uh, in, in Germany, in Denmark. And, and, and I, I read this verse and I say, Malachi, rebuke the, the Gentiles who are bringing incense, who are doing things that are contrary to the Torah. But then I realize, wait, this is God's word. And here's my take on this, Michael. Malachi is talking here about God's name is great among the nations, and maybe the nations don't always get it right to the letter of the Torah. But they're doing the best they can with what they have in their cultural context, and they're receiving Yehovah's name and glorifying his name. And that is something that will draw them to the Torah. That is something mm. that draws them to the God of Israel. And yes, there might be some details they don't get right. We were talking last night in your hot tub about how China almost became a Christian country. They had accepted officially, the emperor had converted to Catholicism, right? right. And, um, and they would have eventually gone through a Protestant Reformation, just like Europe probably, right? Um, they had officially converted to Catholicism, hundreds or tens of millions of Chinese and the emperor. And then they had this ceremony, which is the, at the heart of Chinese culture called Qingming, where they go to the graves of their ancestors and they bring offerings. And the pope... Now, the Pope in the Vatican has all kinds of bones of dead saints. <laughs> right. So he writes a letter <laughs> to the emperor of China and said, I rebuke you. You have to renounce Qingming and stop celebrating your traditional ceremony or I'm going to excommunicate you. And the emperor of China said, okay, you know what? I'm going to do one better. I'm going to make Christianity, Christianity illegal. And it was illegal after that for hundreds of years to be a Catholic, a Protestant. Anything that had anything to do with Christianity was mm. completely illegal because uh, the Pope was trying to impose, but basically the Pope was the Torah police, right? And I'm not even saying the Pope was wrong. He should have applied it to himself, right? Meaning if it's some pagan thing where you're worshiping your ancestors, why does the Pope have all these bones in the Vatican of different saints that they're coming and burning incense to? Mm -hmm. But I, I believe what Malachi is saying is God is that big that he can accept the nations honoring his name even if they don't get all the details right. They're doing the best they can. You know what? You shouldn't be burning incense in a church in Iceland. You shouldn't be burning incense in a church. It should only be at the temple in Jerusalem, in a church in Sweden, in, in Germany. You should be doing it at the temple in Jerusalem, which has been destroyed, so you can't do it. But they were doing the best they could with what they had. And Malachi and the prophecy, the word of Yehovah, I think is, is acknowledging that, that the Gentiles are where they are, they're doing that. And that's why God is so amazing. He meets people where they are. That's what excites me so much about this. You know, I'll meet people, Michael, from all over the world. I met this woman in China. This was my first visit to China before I went to live there for a year. And I was in Beijing and I'm talking to her through an interpreter. And she says to me, uh, she's part of a little house church, which has a very small number of people meeting in secret at the time. And she says, you know, I had this dream and I asked my house church what I should do. And they said, you need to go ask a Jew. And what was her dream? Her dream was she was told to keep the Torah. She was told to do the Torah. And she says to me through the interpreter, you're Jewish, can you tell me what the Torah is? And you have to understand, I had like three minutes to answer through an interpreter, which means wow. really like 30 seconds. I'm not sure I did as good a job as Yeshua would have done or Rabbi Hillel would have done. I did the best I could at the, under the circumstances, completely taken aback by the, by the, by the question, not really, really fully knowing how to answer. Um, but we have this thing where God is doing something with people around the world. And maybe they don't fit my paradigm of the people God is supposed to be giving dreams to and, 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 and somehow interacting with, but they fit his paradigm, right? He's willing to talk to the Gentile who burns incense in their temple. 
but who honors the name of Yehovah. That's how beautiful and wonderful this is. That, that's incredible. A revelation dream yeah. to keep the Torah and and the, the people there say you need to speak to a Jew. And who shows up from halfway around the world? Right. You are the one that she asked. Incredible, so. right? And, and like I said, maybe I didn't do the be- give the best answer. I gave the best I, I could. I, again, I, I, I bet you were the best one for the job or you wouldn't have been sent I, there. I did the best I could as Yehovah's humble servant. Um, and maybe next time I'd answer better. But uh, uh, the point is, here's a woman who literally didn't had no idea what I was talk, you know, what this dream was talking about, right? And this she, is a Chinese Christian, a Chinese house Christian church. in a house church in an underground church. She knows nothing what's going on. The internet is censored there. You can't go online and um, you know and, and just get. I mean, Google until recently was censored, and even the Google that's going in now is censored, right? Um, so you know they have their they're in their own sort of bubble and uh, have no idea what's going on in the outside world, no concept in many cases. And here she is having this dream. And, and my paradigm says, wait a minute, God doesn't talk to Christians, I'm a Jew. He's not supposed to talk <laughs> to people who don't have the same theology as me, who don't keep the same practices as me, who don't eat the same foods as me. Yet she had that dream and, and came to me and said, help me, what, what does this mean? And I did the best I could to answer her. And now I understand with humility, that Yehovah can talk to anybody he wants to. He can do anything he wants to in the way he wants to. And, and Wait, wait, and, wait, yeah. just that thing right there. Yeah. You know, the Christians of the world need to listen to this because mm. this applies directly to them because they would say the same thing about you. They sure God would, can't, yeah. you know, the Christians will say, oh, God can't talk to a Jew. Well, what do you mean about me? They say that about each other. Right? <laughs> if they're not in the right denomination, they'll say, God can't talk to a Catholic. God can't talk to a Baptist. God can't talk to a Lutheran. Hey guys, let God be God. Let God talk to whoever and, 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 and inspire whoever he wants to inspire. Because even those who are burning incense to his name in violation of the Torah, but are honoring his name the best they can. And you know, maybe one day they'll come along and they'll understand what they're actually supposed to keep. Michael, I don't think we'll have time to get to it, but I wanna have a conversation with you about the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, because I think this ties in directly to this issue. So I wanna table that for a minute and get back later to Acts 15 if we can. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. I, I wanna do that. Uh, tell, tell us uh, about this, because yeah. we, we actually have a- An authentic a, a, one, right? A, yeah, authentic one. This is from 1644, right. and give us the background okay. and how this relates to- so, America. Okay, so let me start with this. This is the, I hope people can see it, put up a graphic on the screen. Mm-hmm. This is the, the uh, silver round, one tri ounce of silver that I had produced at a mint in Utah. And it was based on these coins, which I had photos of from the internet um, from the 1640s. And it says, Eustus Eudix, righteous judge, referring to Psalm 9 5 and Jeremiah 11 20 in certain verses in the New Testament. And then in the middle it says, Yehovah, with the full vowels. On the back it says, My name is great among the nations in Hebrew and English, Malachi 1 11. And um, I put this out and made this available to people. And we have a mutual friend, John, who heard about this. And he said, I'm going to go get a real one. <laughs> and he found on a European. Uh, bidding site, and I shouldn't say this because he wants to be the only one bidding for these things, and I think we just spoiled it for him, but in any event, he was able to get an authentic one, and he sent it off to NGC, which is the organization in America that authenticates coins to make sure that it was real, and he has it here encased. This is an authentic two-mark coin, um, which was the lower denomination, and this actually ties into the history of the United States in an incredible way, which I did not expect when I started looking at this and working on this. So when the United States was founded, we did not have a currency. And the Continental Congress had this crisis. There were dozens of different coins being used throughout the 13 colonies. And they had to make a decision, okay, you merchant, do whatever you want. You decide to take uh, the currency from Sweden and the currency from, from Holland and the currency from wherever, and you do what you want. But the treasury of the United States has to have a standard of what currency they'll accept at what values. Well, today, if you want to know the value of a currency, you go online and you check the international, uh, international Forex, the exchange rates, right, mm-hmm. which are constantly fluctuating. Well, it didn't work that way back then. The standard coin that was used throughout the colonies and really throughout much of the world was the Spanish uh, pilar or piece of eight. 
That was the standard coin, and that eventually became the, the, the U.S. dollar. But mm -hmm. we're talking 1776 before the Constitution. So they commissioned Thomas Jefferson to go study all the coins that were being used and decides which ones would be valid to be accepted as official currency in the United States, and he made a list. And the really cool thing here, Michael, is we, he made a handwritten list that was presented to the Continental Congress on September 2nd, 1776, right? So remember, July 4th, 1776 is Declaration of Independence. The Continental Congress is still meeting before, before there's a constitution, years before right. the constitution. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the war is just is just gearing up the the war, war, American War of Independence, or as the British thought, the rebellion. Um, September second, seventeen seventy six. This is approved by the Continental Congress. Listing of series of different currencies. And I can actually show the people here the page wow. in the actual handwriting of Thomas Jefferson. Michael, I read about this years ago, but as I was trying to produce this uh, replica of the coin in silver, I said I want to see the page for myself. What I read about years ago. And I found in the Library of Congress, they have this handwritten document approved by the Continental Congress, written by Thomas Jefferson, and it lists the different currencies. And you can actually see here at the top, it says uh, silver coins. It says the pilar, piece of eight, and that is the uh, unit or dollar. And they're talking about the Spanish dollar, not the mm -hmm. US dollar, the Spanish mm -hmm. piece of eight. Mm -hmm. And it lists different coins. And, what, and it has here the English guinea and various other coins. And later on it says, the uh, the ducat of Holland, the ducat of Germany, the ducat of Sweden, and the ducat of Denmark. The ducat of Denmark, one of the list of coins that was official currency in the United States when it was established as a nation, essentially even before it was fully established for the Constitution, was this coin, was this coin with the name of Yehovah on it. So this was true money accepted at the time as an equivalent in varying uh, 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 proportions to the Spanish dollar. And I mean, I read that and I'm like blown away. So here you have a king in Denmark. He doesn't know whether there's gonna be colonies 100 years later that will use his coin, but it becomes used in circulation and it's so recognizable that it becomes one of the coins used by merchants. And they say, the ducat of Denmark, that's official currency. <laughs> that was September 2nd, which is exactly two months after we declared our independence from England, uh, which is two days before the Declaration of Independence, the document mm -hmm. was actually signed. But it was right. two months, July 2nd to September 2nd, and yeah. his name is made great among the nations. Among, and, and, and in this case, the founding of the nation, the founding of what I believe is the greatest democracy the world's ever seen. Yeah. Uh, you know, this, this nation that, look, and I'll just speak from my very personal perspective as a Jew, you know, Jews were, you know, I call myself half jokingly the wandering Jew because in 2012, I left Israel and have been traveling around the world teaching and preaching and doing all kinds of other things ever since. And... Um, you know, sharing, sharing the word of God from the scriptures the best I know how. And I call myself joking the wan jokingly the wandering Jew. But where that joke comes from is that for 2,000 years, my ancestors were wandering Jews. They would live in a country, get kicked out. Live in a country, get kicked out. Well, how do you kick someone out who's lived there for 200 years? Because you're Jews. You have no rights in this country. We're just mm -hmm. kicking you out. Move on. And it wasn't until they came to the United States that finally Jews were accepted as full citizens and, and it's my hope and prayer that the United States doesn't become like other countries and say, you know, what, we're getting rid of our Jews. I hope that doesn't happen. I hope and pray. Um, I don't know. Some things I see in the news make me really nervous. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that there's definitely some scary things going on. And, and quite frankly, well, I don't know if I should say this here. They're coming from one particular direction, and it's not the one the mainstream media is telling you. The anti-Semitism isn't coming from where the mainstream media is telling you. It's actually the opposite. It's almost like the mainstream media has become a smokescreen for what the real agenda is, this yeah. hatred mm -hmm. of Jews, which is masquerading as anti-Zionism, but it's really a form of anti-Semitism. Well, this nation was based on God-given rights, mm -hmm. and it is the God of Israel. Yes. That is the God-given rights, and this is what mm -hmm. our, our jurisprudence system, our legal system, is based on Torah law. Well, you know, Michael, it, it's really based on the fundamental, you know, people talk about the Judeo-Christian ethic. The fundamental principle, from my perspective, of the Judean christian ethic is, it's in Genesis chapter one, where it says God created man in his image. And it says male and female, he created them. So this 
core principle that God made humankind consisting of male and female in the image of God. And by the way, that doesn't mean God has a big hook nose. It doesn't mean he has two arms with 10 fingers. When it says we're created in the image of God, that's speaking about our soul. We have a soul as humans, every human being, in a way that animals don't have. Mm -hmm. We have that intelligence that God has given us, that discernment. That's what it means to be born, to be created in the image of God. And, and, and this is the source of our, I mean, this is in, in, in U.S. constitutional law, they call this natural law. Right. And this mm -hmm. is the source of our rights. Our rights are not granted by a government. We right. do not get the right of free speech from the government of the United States. We get it from God. And the Constitution of the United States has done something that no other government before and very few since have acknowledged, which is our God-given right of free speech to defend ourselves and other rights. These are rights that come to us as the founders of the United States established from God himself. And because we are created in the image of God, Michael, I want to talk in, in, in the second half about the clash between those who love the name of Yehovah as represented in this coin and those in the Western civilization who have hated his name and what havoc that has wreaked.